How's it going everyone? This is Badger here with another video for VATMM. Today we're going to take a look at a cut and ambitious sounding mission from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. A mission where we had to stay away from roadblocks, then shake off a helicopter that's chasing us, and finally dig a hole in an aircraft graveyard by playing a minigame. You might be wondering why after 18 years of the game being out, are you only hearing about this mysterious mission for the first time? Well, you can thank the definitive edition of the game, the one developed by the hardworking professionals at Grove Street Games, for leaking some super secret internal studio files in their masterpiece. Thanks to their unparalleled level of carelessness, we got ourselves a previously unseen text file, where Rockstar North developers used to store outdated text strings while developing the game. For them, it was a dump for various scrapped lines, but for us, it's a holy grail of cut content. This is where we found 30 in-game strings from a cut mission, V Crash 2. Judging from its code name, it was going to be the second mission for Crash in Las Venturas. And if my theory is correct, then the mission was going to be called Chopper Overhead. Feel free to pause the video to read more about this theory. Anyway, you know what's more strange? The mission V Crash 2 actually does exist in the final game, but it's there as the mission High Noon. As you might have already guessed, it isn't even remotely similar to the mission I teased you with in the first few seconds of this video, but both of them share the same idea. So in order to understand the scrapped mission better, let's quickly take a peek at what the mission High Noon was about. High Noon begins with a scene where Frank Tenpenny, Eddie Pulaski, and Jimmy Hernandez arrive to retrieve the incriminating dossier from Carl, which he acquired in the previous mission for them. But Frank is still not satisfied. He takes a shovel from the trunk and suddenly slams Hernandez with it, knocking him over and calling him a snitch. Then Tenpenny orders Carl to dig a grave for Hernandez, implying that he will also be digging his own grave too, and he orders Pulaski to watch him, leaving the scene with the dossier. But something goes wrong with the plan. Turns out Jimmy isn't dead yet. He suddenly regains consciousness and tries to ambush Pulaski, but fails. This move saved Carl's life, but Jimmy's story has finally come to an end. And then this stupid thing happens. Instead of shooting us, Pulaski decides to just run away like a coward. Then he enters this mysterious buffalo that we've never seen before the mission that has a license plate with his name on it and hits the gas. But we all know how it ended. We say goodbye to the corrupt cop and continue our journey towards completing the game. But the story wasn't always like that before. Thanks to the leaked text strings, we now know that this part of the game played out quite differently. To make this analysis more interesting, I've asked a modder, a scene, to try to recreate this cut mission from scratch, and he did. This is why I have some cool footage to show you. But it wouldn't be possible without Vital, Mysterio, and Seaman, who all helped him too. And to make it even better, I want to thank Zara Animation for voicing Tenpenny and Ronald Hamrock for voicing the motel guy. You guys rock too. And please, do not forget that everything you see or hear in this video is definitely not 100% correct. This is because there is not much else left over from this mission, and 30 scrap text strings are clearly not enough to understand the whole picture. But it should at least give you an idea of how it could have played out. Now, without any further ado, let's finally talk about the backstory of this cut mission. What we understood from those lines is that the mission was based on helping Tenpenny get rid of Jimmy Hernandez's body. Sadly, we don't know how it all happened, but it seems like he didn't come up with anything better than to hide the body in his private car. At the same time, the absence of Jimmy became known to law enforcement officials, and they began to patrol the area and set up roadblocks. All of this caused a lot of problems for Tenpenny, and once again we found ourselves ordered to help him out and clean up this mess. Judging from the strings, the mission began with meeting Tenpenny who said these exact words. We gotta get rid of the body. Take the car and head for the motel. A little bit later, or maybe right after we met him, he revealed the rest of the unpleasant details about the situation. The cops radio confirmed my car is hot. Avoiding the roadblocks. Well, there you have it. By saying we, Tenpenny made his problem our problem as well. But once again, all the dirty work is left up to us. Can you guess why exactly are we going to a motel? Well, it seems that Frank and Carl didn't have a shovel to do the job. If we weren't going there to pick up a shovel, then we have no freaking idea what it could have been. You'll understand why later. So while we're heading to the motel, our objective was to avoid any roadblocks in our path. This is why I think that law enforcement was involved in this, because who else could sniff around and roll out these pesky roadblocks? 
Since Tenpenny said cop radio, I'm guessing it was the rural police that took the lead in this investigation. But it could also be FBI agents who were involved in the previous mission about acquiring the dossier. I guess we'll never find out though. But what we do know is the way that we could have screwed up the driving part of the mission. It seems that when we did something that looked suspicious, Tenpenny would probably say this. Now you've done it. Every car match your minds will be stopped. Judging from the R token in the string, doing that would instantly fail the mission. However, if we were doing everything right but for some reason decide to exit the vehicle, then the game would ask us to get back in the car and take it to the motel. So it wasn't that hot around. We also think that we were doing this mission alone because Tenpenny clearly spoke to us over the phone, staying in the shadows. There are tons of facts suggesting this and you'll understand why later. When we finally reached the motel, we were greeted by the motel guy, who was contacted likely by Tenpenny moments before, saying this. Officer Tenpenny says you'll be needing this. After we took the item he gave us, which was probably a shovel because what else could it be, Tenpenny then said this. Good. Now head out to the aircraft graveyard. I think Hernandez was an enthusiast. And this is where we were going to get rid of the body, but the second sentence doesn't make any sense. I think the developers hit a joke or a reference to Jimmy. He was either an aircraft enthusiast, which would be ironic to bury him in a place like that, or a graveyard enthusiast, which would be kinda creepy, I guess. Both of these facts are never revealed in the final game, so who knows what Tempany actually meant and what Hernandez was like. After we would have begun heading to the aircraft graveyard, we triggered the second and most interesting part of this mission. It all begins with this quote from Frank. Listen up, a shot wasn't a prowl. Shake him if you hear him. As you can see, another problem for us was a helicopter that would have been patrolling the area. Despite the fact that Tenpenny strongly recommended avoiding it, the text string suggests that no matter what, it would have still tailed Carl and caused him trouble. And when that happened, Frank would explain to us why this was such a bummer. He's on your tail. If he gets a good look at your plates, we got a situation. Starting from this very moment, it would have become a cat and mouse game, where the main goal was to get rid of the chopper and not let him read our license plate at any cost. This is why I think we were driving Tenpenny's personal car, because otherwise, it doesn't make any sense as to why he was so worried about some stupid license plates. During this section, if Carl was doing well and the helicopter couldn't keep up with us, Tenpenny would praise us. Nice driving. He's having trouble staying with you. However, if Carl was about to jeopardize the entire operation by letting the pilot read the plates, Frank would probably say this. Quick, Carl, get away from the chopper! If the situation wasn't that bad and Carl decided to get out of the car during the chase, the game would give you a warning that said, That chopper is still about. You'll be caught red-handed. Get back in the car and lose that bug. In other words, the game asked us to stop fooling around. And finally, if Carl failed to keep his distance from the chopper for some time while allowing the pilot to read the plates, Tenpenny would yell this. Shit, shit, a positive ID. Now you're in major trouble. Despite the fact that there's no R token, you have to assume that it would still instantly fail the mission. Funny enough, at this point, Frank says that Carl is in major trouble, not he and Carl, which would make more sense. Either he was manipulating Carl this whole time by feeding him with false information, or we don't know all the details. According to those text strings, it would have been impossible to get out of the chase. But during this mission, the helicopter had one interesting and never-before-seen condition. It had a limited amount of fuel, and this chase wouldn't last forever. How do we know that? Well, if the player was doing well, then Frank eventually cheered the player on by saying this. Keep it up, he's low on fuel. I guess this and the rest of the information we got from Frank was passed around the police radio frequency, which he previously confirmed to be listening to. As a result, sooner or later, the helicopter had to stop following us to get refueled, which would trigger this quote. The chopper's bugging out to refuel. We've got time to dig that hole. At this time, Tenpenny said we again. But anyway, the second phase of the mission seemed to come to an end at this point, and we had finally received an opportunity to head to the aircraft graveyard to dig that hole with the shovel that we probably got from the motel. And let's not forget that we always had to be careful with the car that we got. If you managed to destroy it, then the game would say, The car's wrecked and Hernandez is still inside. Great job, dumbass. And according to the token, the mission failed instantly. Obviously, you had to save the car to the very end at any cost to reach an exact outcome, meaning that you had to bury him. Not to abandon the car or blow it up with a body inside somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and not to dunk the car in the river or whatever else your imagination is capable of doing. 
It would be too easy to complete the mission this way, and it would break the lore. So, somewhere here at the aircraft graveyard was going to be the perfect place to dig a hole. And once you reached it, the game would say, we've got to dig a hole for this corpse before that chopper comes back. I wonder how the chopper pilot would know the exact place where we would be digging after they were done refueling. I guess the developers tried very hard to stop players from screwing around and going off script. Starting from this very moment, we triggered the third and final part of this mission, where we had to dig a hole by playing a minigame. How do we know that? Well, the game told us to follow the on-screen prompts and keep up a steady rhythm, adding that there ain't no going back now. By thinking logically, it was probably something similar to the dancing in Lowrider minigames, only instead of having fun, we're stuck doing dirty work by hiding evidence of someone else's crime in a creepy aircraft graveyard. But it was a special minigame, as it also had fatigue and hole depth bars on your screen. We guessed that the fatigue bar was some kind of time limit in this minigame, because Carl can't dig a hole forever and the hole depth bar most likely filled up by how successfully we pushed the buttons keeping up a rhythm. And speaking of buttons, according to these tokens, they were cross, circle, square, and triangle. Those are the DualShock 2 buttons. No surprise there at all. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas was initially developed for PlayStation 2, showing that these strings are quite old and rusty. At first glance, it seems that the digging was a copy of the dancing minigame, because we're pushing the exact same buttons in the PS2 version. But it isn't that simple. These scrapped strings look more like hints telling you what you need to press right now. This is something we never had during the rhythm-based missions. Even the rest of the scrapped lines don't suggest that. What if the digging was more like a quick-time event minigame? For instance, press the triangle button now, and now square to dig, or something like that. Or maybe it was indeed a copy of the dancing or lowrider minigame, but with hints at the beginning. Who knows? What we do know is the fact that the digging minigame also rated the player on how well they performed. Okay, excellent, poor, and too slow were four known rates you could get here. No need to guess which one's good or bad, the tokens here help too. And I wonder, did we dig in complete silence or was there tense music in the background? I mean, what created the aforementioned rhythm? I guess we'll never know, but what is known is that this minigame had two outcomes. If Carl didn't dig well, then the game would tell us that a half-dug hole looks a bit suspicious, don't you think? This place is too hot now, and the mission failed. It would be even more crazy if that chopper suddenly found us doing bad stuff. If Carl dug well, then the game would congratulate us by saying, great job, that hole should be big enough now. And that's basically it. We know nothing about what happened next because the text from this cut mission suddenly ends here. My guess is that there was going to be a cutscene with CJ pushing Hernandez into the hole and then filling it up. Or maybe the mission was abandoned right at that moment. This is kind of sad because we don't know what we had to do with Tenpenny's car after. He was so worried about that thing and the license plate during the whole mission. And what about the police? We just hid the body and everyone suddenly forgot about Jimmy in the car? What about that chopper that could come back? And most importantly, why did Carl not have a single line during this mission? Maybe it was just a concept at that time. And once again, I want to remind you that everything you saw was just a recreation of that cut mission based on those leaked text strings. According to their numbers, some of the strings are lost forever, I guess. And it also could have been any of the motels in the desert that we were heading to in the first half of the mission. Fort Carson, for instance, has lots of them. There's no way to guess what motel was the right one. Without a doubt, the meeting with Tenpenny could have taken place somewhere else. There are tons of other creepy and abandoned places in the desert where you could silently meet with a corrupt cop. And I am 99% sure that we drove off in a different car during the mission. I actually wonder what it could be. But no matter what, it was quite an interesting and ambitious mission for that time. More importantly, it doesn't even look similar to any other mission we have in the game. Tell me at least one mission with three different phases apart from the final mission. Think about it. But the deeper we look, the more questions we have. If this wasn't the mission where Pulaski died, then how did he die in the earlier version of the game? How and where did Carl give the dossier to these cops, which ended with Jimmy's elimination in the final game? Why did we receive this strange and goofy mission by the name of High Noon, where we first get watched by Pulaski with a gun, but then he suddenly runs away like a coward and enters that mysterious buffalo we never saw before the mission? Well, at least we can find one answer in the sources from Misappropriation, in a brief section left by Chris Rothwell, the creator of the mission. According to the earlier plot, there was no dossier, not even a mention. 
The developer wrote that the main goal was an assassination, probably of the reporters, who arrived to the ghost town probably in his own car, while the district attorney and FBI arrived in separate helicopters. It seems that earlier we intervened in the meeting between the authorities and the reporter. In the final version of the game, instead of the reporter and the district attorney, we got an officer of the Drug Enforcement Administration who was meeting with an FBI agent. It seems that after changing the key figures, the developers came up with the idea to include the dossier that we had to acquire. Other than that, the mission didn't change much from what Chris wrote in that brief section. If there was no dossier in the lore, then why did Frank eliminate Jimmy? Maybe he was leaking information about them to that reporter that got cut. What's more interesting is when you take a look at the dates in both sources from the crash mission in Las Venturas, the mission misappropriation dates back to August of 2003, while High Noon dates back to June 2004. The difference between those two dates is almost a year. If they correspond to the day when these missions were created, then it makes High Noon a late addition to the game, and it was probably made in a rush, thus explaining why there are so many goofs and plot holes in it. For instance, in the cutscene, we're digging a grave behind a house, but when the cutscene ends, Pulaski and Carl are both running from a graveyard, which is located slightly behind the house. The game doesn't explain why Pulaski's private car was parked in this ghost town. We clearly see that all three cops arrive in Tenpenny's police car, and there's no buffalo in the cutscene. And what about the bandito? A couple of seconds ago, it didn't exist either. Are we just going crazy? Do you know why Pulaski ran away after the cutscene? Well, in the official Brady Games guide, it is said that Pulaski finishes Hernandez, but the cop's dying fall puts a weapon in CJ's hands. Pulaski, a coward to the end, runs for his car. So this is what should have happened during that strange scene? It would make so much more sense if it was actually done as they said in their official guide. And take a look at his gun. It's an ordinary pistol. After the cutscene, he's suddenly using the Desert Eagle. If we didn't know about the previous fact with the cutscene, then we could easily say that he found a new gun in his car, but in the final version it looks more like a stupid goof. And what about this? I think most people usually end up destroying his car in the chase sequence, and what do they see later? Well, Pulaski is seen just injured and sitting in front of his car that's been magically repaired. It doesn't make much sense. But honestly, there is no surprise in any of that. If we look at the debug menu, which was leaked with the mission sources, then we can see that the second cutscene, which is internally called B, with Carl digging a grave, is located at the end of the selection screen. Not to mention, for some reason it has animations from the cutscene A inside. The developers didn't even mark which cutscene in this list is A and which is B, as they did with the rest of the cutscenes. What a mess. All of these facts show that the mission High Noon was a very late addition, and they didn't have time to polish it. I guess this is why the mission Misappropriation has a few stupid goofs in it too. In the cutscene, Tenpenny says this. Now there's a ruined town out west of here, Aldea Malvada, and there's some piece of DEA officer meeting with an FBI agent with a dossier. Now you get the dossier and you make both of them disappear. Instead of the aforementioned meeting, we see this, um, guy holding a dossier and staring at the house. In order to complete the mission, we can just eliminate him and take the document. According to Tenpenny's speech, it was the FBI agent. Okay, fine, then where's the DEA officer that we had to eliminate too? At this time, the official guide, while retelling the cutscene, tells us about eliminating one agent with a dossier. Another goof, I guess. And you know what? After changing the plot, it makes no sense for the authorities to meet in the desert. Why did they decide to get rid of that reporter? Too many missions for Crash where we were killing reporters, I guess? I am very grateful for the Definitive Edition and their hard-working professionals for leaking Rockstar's internal files. If not for them, we would have probably never known about this cut mission and the rest of the details. And of course, I want to thank Asin and the rest of his pals for trying to recreate this mission from scratch. If you're interested, this mission will be, or is already available, for everybody to mess around in. If you want to try it, you should check the description under this video. Maybe the link is already there. For more videos on Grand Theft Auto and other stuff that might be related to it, or maybe not, be sure to check out my channel, Badger Goodger, right here on YouTube. And don't forget to follow both Vadim and I on Twitter. This has been Badger, and I hope you have a great rest of your day out there.